Now, diabetic ketoacidosis is an acute complication of type 1 diabetes. And it occurs when there is a deficiency of insulin. So if there's not enough insulin, for whatever reason, then ketone bodies will start to accumulate in the blood. There will be a ketoacidosis. And this can occur at presentation. If someone didn't know they were type 1 diabetic, then obviously they wouldn't be taking insulin. And when they present into our care, they can be in a diabetic ketoacidotic state. Or for various reasons, people can stop taking their insulin after diagnosis. The supply of insulin, or for some reason they just stop taking it. It does happen, and they can be admitted in a ketoacidotic state. And also, infection can really mess up the control of type 1 diabetes. So sometimes when patients get a bad infection, they can become ketotic and can also be admitted in a ketoacidotic state. So let's try and work out what's happening here. And we're going to start this story by looking at a fat cell, which is an adipocyte. So here we have a fat cell, an adipocyte. And like any other cell, it has a nucleus and a cytoplasm, but it's got a large central vacuole that contains fat. Now when there's high levels of insulin in the blood, the insulin causes fat to migrate from the blood for storage in the cell. So high levels of insulin means that the fat goes from the blood into the cell. Conversely, when the levels of insulin are low and fat is needed by the body for metabolic processes, low levels of insulin allow fat to go from the fat cell from the adipocyte back into the blood. And diabetes type 1 does not affect the alpha cells, so even if there's an insulin deficiency, there's still glucagon. glucagon and glucagon will also cause fat to go from the fat cell into the blood. So the lack of insulin and the normal amounts of glucagon mean that you get quite a lot of free fatty acids going into the blood. So when someone's hypoinsulinemic there's going to be free fatty acids going into the blood. And these free fatty acids circulate around to the liver. And in the liver, the free fatty acids are converted to ketones. So the more free fatty acids there are in the blood, the more ketones the liver will produce. And the liver will excrete these ketones into the blood. So as a result of the low levels of insulin, we have more free fatty acids. The liver converts these free fatty acids into ketones, and this means we have more ketones in the blood. We have a ketonemia. A ketonemia. And this has got several implications. One is quite useful for us. Because the high levels of ketones in the blood, some of them are excreted by the kidneys. And this means that we can see the ketones in the urine. There's a ketone urea, and we can test for this with our dipsticks. So there's a ketone urea because there's high levels of ketones in the blood, and the kidney will excrete these. And it's the high levels of ketones that also give the patient the characteristic smell to their breath, caused by the high levels of acetone, which remember is the volatile ketone body. But of course, remember the ketones, two of the ketones are acids. So you get high levels of ketones in the blood, the acetoacetic acid and the beta-hydroxybutyric acid, in the blood means that we get high levels of acid. There's an acidosis. 
Now, you might think that this whole thing is a bit bizarre. Why would the body generate an acidosis? Well, the reason is that the ketone bodies are actually quite useful because ketone bodies can actually be used by normal body cells to produce energy. And unlike glucose, the ketone bodies can migrate freely into the cells where the mitochondria can use them to produce energy. So in the absence of glucose inside the cell, because the glucose can't be transported into the cell, the ketone bodies can be used by the normal body cells, like the muscle cells and the fat cells, to produce energy. So that's, in a sense, it's good, because we have a maintenance of energy production. But the cells can only use the ketones slowly. So the ketone bodies in the blood accumulate. We get this ketonemia because the liver is producing them much more quickly than the peripheral cells can use them. So it is good. It's good because we can check for the ketonuria, but the patient has this smell on their breath from the acetone, and also the patient develops acidosis. And obviously acidosis is a dangerous condition. Now, what does the acidosis do? Well, the acidosis is detected by the respiratory center in the medulla oblongata and leads to hyperventilation. There is rapid, deep breathing as the patient tries to compensate for the acidosis. And again, we can recognize this. We can recognize this rapid, deep breathing, this sort of air hunger that we get in acidosis. And also the acidosis affects the nerves and the peripheral blood vessels and causes a vasodilation. So there's a peripheral vasodilation. And these patients, because they're vasodilated for a period of time, tend to lose heat and they become hypothermic. There's a hypothermia. But as well as that, if there's a vasodilation, then I think you can see that that's going to lower peripheral resistance and that can lead to low blood pressure. So the vasodilation can lead to hypotension. Now we already know that these patients are hyperglycemic. They're hyperglycemic, obviously, because they're lacking insulin. So the lack of insulin is going to cause hyperglycemia. And as we've already seen, hyperglycemia can lead to an osmotic diuresis. There's going to be an osmotic diuresis. And the osmotic diuresis is going to mean that the patient is dehydrated and can actually become hypovolemic and the hypovolemia will also contribute to the hypotension so these patients can be hypotensive because they're vasodilated and because they're hypovolemic they're hypovolemic because they've had an osmotic diuresis secondary to the hyperglycemia secondary to the hypo insulin emia. And if they're hypovolemic, they can become hypotensive. So they're hypotensive. And if the hypotension gets bad enough, these patients can develop shock. And shock, of course, is a life-threatening condition. So these patients are at risk from shock. Now, the osmotic diuresis means the patient's losing a lot of fluid. And as well as losing a lot of fluid, the osmotic diuresis leaches out a lot of potassium as well. So these patients can become hypokalemic. They're low in potassium. And if the blood is very low in potassium, 
that can affect the way that the heart is working. And uh, that can lead to cardiac arrhythmias, which is another possible cause of, of death. So, the acidosis leads to a diabetic ketoacidosis. There's a diabetic ketoacidosis, and the acidosis is going to affect the way that all of the enzymes in the body work, particularly the enzymes in the brain, and this is also life-threatening. So the acidosis is life-threatening because of the direct effect of the acid threatening the patient, because of the shock threatening the patient, and because of the hypokalemia also threatening the patient. So, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do for these patients? Well, we need to monitor their fluid and electrolytes. If they're hypokalemic, we need to monitor their fluid and electrolytes and give them some potassium. As always with potassium, we monitor the electrolytes very carefully and we give it cautiously because we don't want rapid changes in the amount of potassium in the blood. Now if the patient's hyperglycemic, can you think of any ways we could treat hyperglycemia? Well of course we're going to give them insulin. So these patients are going to need insulin. Because they're hypothermic, we can keep them warm. We can monitor their body temperature. And because they've had an osmotic diuresis and they're going to be hypovolemic, secondary to the osmotic diuresis, then clearly we need to give them fluids. So the mainstay of treatment is to keep these patients warm. It's to give them fluids. It's to give them insulin. It's to check and titrate potassium replacement. And if they've got an infection, we can give them some antibiotics. So that's the chain of event that happens in diabetic ketoacidosis. All treatable, and of course the earlier we catch this condition, the more likely treatment is to be successful without serious systemic complications developing.